Now I want to dive into all of the psychological experiments and practices that were conducted between 1920 and 1968, before we had the knowledge, laws, and regulations that we do today. All of the things we're going to talk about could not happen today for so many reasons. And unfortunately, a lot of people and animals were harmed by these terrible studies. But there was a reason that researchers at the time felt these actions were necessary. These experiments are taught to those of us who are taking psychology classes or becoming mental health professionals. However, I think we all need to know about them, understand why they happened, and what key takeaways there are. Without further ado, let's discuss the first unethical study, Little Albert. It was conducted by behaviorist John B. Watson and graduate student Rosalie Rayner in 1920. The test subject? A nine-month-old baby boy named Albert. The goal of the study was to build on what the field of psychology had already learned from an experiment conducted by Ivan Pavlov. In his experiment, Pavlov showed us how dogs could be classically conditioned using treats and a bell. In short, by ringing the bell and then giving the dogs the treats over and over, they became so conditioned to this pairing that the dogs would salivate just by hearing the bell ring. Years later, John B. Watson wanted to see if humans could be classically conditioned as well and decided to conduct his study on a human baby. Watson and Rayner exposed baby Albert to various stimuli, like a rabbit, different types of masks, wool, a white rat, there were a bunch of different things. And Albert wasn't scared of any of them. Then Watson showed Albert just the white rat. And behind his back, he hit a metal pipe really hard with a hammer, making a very loud noise, which caused Albert to cry. Every time Albert touched the white rat, Watson would hit the pipe with the hammer. And it wasn't long before Albert would cry at the sight of the white rat. It is even reported that Albert generalized his fear to include a lot of white hairy things like Santa Claus, rabbits, dogs, and other animals, making more and more of his environment scary and unpleasant. Now, obviously, conducting a study on an infant seems like a terrible thing to do, but there are reasons that certain studies may need to include children. And that's why there are now federal laws in place to ensure studies involving children meet the ethical and regulatory requirements. But the larger problem here is that Watson and Rayner never extinguished baby Albert's conditioned fear response. They stated that this was because he moved away shortly after the study, but let's be honest, that should have been required. Not taking the time to eliminate Albert's conditioned response more than likely led to issues for him later in life. Now here are 106's two mothers. Next, I want to talk about Harlow's monkey experiments that were conducted in the 1950s. These studies were created because much of the research at the time supported the idea that babies become attached to their mothers simply because they feed them. Harlow, however, believed that it was deeper than that and the attachment a child has to its mother has more to do with comfort, safety, and security. Food was only one part of the equation. In order to prove his hypothesis, Harlow took infant monkeys from their mothers and replaced them with two surrogate mothers. And now I'm quoting from a Psychological Sciences article, one was a simple construction of wire and wood and the second was covered in foam, rubber, and soft terry cloth. The infant monkeys were assigned to one of two conditions. In the first, the wire mother had a milk bottle, and the cloth mother did not. In the second, the cloth mother had the food, while the wire mother had none. What they found was that regardless of which mother had the bottle, the infant monkeys spent much more time with the terry cloth mother. If the wire mother had the bottle, they would go there to eat and then quickly return to the cloth mother. If they put a noise-making toy in with the baby monkey, they would go to their cloth mother for comfort, and then, when they felt safe, attack or play with the toy. If there wasn't a mother present at all, and that toy came in, 
they would cower in the corner in fear. And overall, this proved Harlow's theory that attachment occurs for more reasons than just who is feeding us. It involves love, comfort, safety, and security. Although Harlow's studies are still taught in schools all over the world as they demonstrate attachment theory as we know it today, we cannot overlook the unethical nature of these studies. Depriving infant monkeys of their mothers for the first year of their life is detrimental to their development and entirely unethical. Harlow's experiments were later shut down because of this and should stand as a reminder that psychology, or any science for that matter, should never override animal rights and safety. It is May 1962. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. The next study I want to talk about is the Milgram experiment. The results of it were so disturbing that it has changed the way I personally look at people and what they're capable of. This social psychology study was conducted in 1963 by Stanley Milgram with the goal of testing people's levels of obedience to authority figures. There were three people involved in the study. The experimenter, who was the person that was in charge of the session, the teacher, who was a volunteer that was getting paid to come in and assist the experimenter, but they were actually the subjects of the experiment, and finally, the learner, who was a hired actor who knew all about the experiment, but pretended to be a volunteer just like the teacher. The teacher and learner would arrive at this office and pick a strip of paper to figure out if they were going to be a teacher or a learner. Now, all the strips said teacher, but the actor would just pretend to get learner. Then they were placed in separate rooms, and the teacher was instructed to teach the learner some word pairs. If the learner didn't get one of those pairs right, the teacher was told to push a button to give them an electrical shock. They even gave the teachers a small shock to show them that it was working. But know that no shocks were actually given to the learners. With every wrong answer, the shocks would be increased by 15 volts, stopping at a maximum of 450 volts, which can cause serious harm. With each shock, a pre-recorded tape would play a shock-like sound, followed by a painful noise from the learner. If the teacher protested and asked to stop, the experimenter was told to push them to continue at least four times before they would let them stop. Before doing the experiment, Milgram polled some Yale psychology students to see what they thought would happen. And they believed that only a few kind of outlier teachers would administer the highest voltage. However, what his study showed was that 65% of the teachers did deliver the 450 volt shock. Although they did show physical signs of distress while doing it, like sweating a lot, biting their lips, digging their nails into their skin. However, they kept going. The study was repeated many times over in the US and outside, but the average percentage of those teachers who would administer the highest voltage was still 61%, which is just terrifying to me to think that you would know you're harming someone else and just because someone told you to do it, you would keep doing it. I'm at 65 volts. Time. Let me out. Continue, please. Go on. Sh sharp. Axe, needle, stick, blade. Ask, please. Wrong. Up to 180 volts. Please continue, teacher. Needle, you're going to get a shot. 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. I'm not going to kill that man. Eh? You hear him hollering? He's I said before, the shocks may be painful, but yeah, they're not dangerous. They're hollering. He can't stand it. What if something happens to him? The experiment requires that you continue, teacher. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get that man sick of that. I mean, he's hollering in there. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> he's Whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until he's well, learned I mean, all the uh, words. I would refuse to take the responsibility of getting hurt in there. I mean, I'm not, I mean, he's under hollering. It's absolutely essential that you continue, teacher. 
There's too many left here. I mean, geez, he, go, he gets wrong here. There's too many of them left. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. You're going to keep giving him, what, 450 volts every shot now? That's correct. Continue. The next word is white. White. 450 volts. Next one is short. Sentence. Movie. First time. All right, excuse me, teacher. We'll have to discontinue the experiment. I'd like to uh, ask you a few questions, if I may. How do you feel about I feel all right, but I don't like what's happened. That I fall in there, he's been howling, and we had to keep giving him shots. I didn't like that one bit. I mean, he's, he wanted to get out, and he just kept going, kept throwing 450 volts. I didn't like that. He wouldn't even look at on that gentleman. Well, who was actually pushing the switch? I was, but he kept insisting. I told him no, but he said he got to keep going. I told him it's time we stopped when we got up to uh, 195, 210 volts. But well, why didn't you just stop? He wouldn't let me. I wanted to stop. Although the results of this experiment were frightening and eye-opening to many, like myself, other researchers were more upset about the lack of proper debriefing and had a lot of ethical concerns about the lifelong impact that this could have on those volunteers. They did find most of those volunteers and they actually polled them. And the majority of them said that they were thankful to have been involved in the study because it helped them be more aware of why they do what they do and ensuring they make choices because it's what's best, not because it's what someone else tells them to do. So although this wasn't the most ethical experiment and the results are just terrifying to me, it doesn't seem to have truly harmed anyone. It might be interesting to judge people today by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try this? Yeah. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Since I'm the teacher and I have blue eyes, I think maybe the blue-eyed people should be on top the first day. I mean, the blue-eyed people are the better people in this room. Oh, yes, they are. Blue-eyed people are smarter than brown eyes. The final study we'll cover today is the blue eyes, brown eyes experiment. This took place on April 5th of 1968 in a third grade classroom, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. A teacher by the name of Jane Elliott wanted to show her students just how hurtful discrimination can be and what it can feel like to be segregated based on physical appearance. Her class was made up of only white children and she felt that they really couldn't understand the impact of racism without having them experience it themselves. So, she split her third graders up according to eye color, blue eyes versus brown eyes. Next, the blue-eyed students were told that they were superior to their brown-eyed classmates. She even gave the blue-eyed students brown fabric collars to place around the necks of their brown-eyed classmates so they could be more easily identified. Well, the brown-eyed people in this room today are going to wear collars so that we can tell from a distance what color your eyes are. Mm -hmm. On page 127, 100. 127, mm -hmm. is everyone ready? Ready, Laurie? Brown-eyed. She's a brown-eyed. You'll begin to notice today that we spend a great deal of time waiting for brown-eyed people. The yardstick's gone. Well, okay. I don't see the yardstick, do you? It's coming over there. Hey, Mrs. Lake, you better keep that on your desk so if the um, brown people, brown eyed people get out of hand. Oh, you think if the brown eyed people get out of hand, that would be the thing to use? Who goes first to lunch? Blue the blue eyed people. No brown eyed people go back for seconds. Blue eyed people may go back for seconds. Brown eyed people not do blue, not. Brown eyed. Don't you know? Oh, they're not smart. Is that the only reason? It might take too much. Okay, quietly. She gave the blue-eyed children extra privileges, like more time at recess or lunch. She encouraged the blue-eyed children to only play with other blue-eyed children. And she wouldn't allow the brown-eyed students to drink from the same water fountain as the blue-eyed children. She also made the brown-eyed students sit at the back of the classroom 
and would seriously reprimand any brown-eyed child who didn't follow the rules, while a blue-eyed child would barely get noticed. The brown-eyed people do not get to use the drinking fountain. You'll have to use the paper cups. You brown-eyed people are not to play with the blue-eyed people on the playground. At first, the children protested. Many were friends with members of the other group and didn't understand why they couldn't play together or why eye color really made one better than the other. In order to make her point, Mrs. Elliot lied to the children and told them that melanin was linked to lower intelligence and learning disability. And shortly thereafter, the children stopped resisting. After a while, the brown-eyed students began to have trouble keeping up with the schoolwork, many not doing as well as normal on their tests, and being much more passive, timid, and many didn't even raise their hands in class anymore. While the blue-eyed students were more bossy, arrogant, and often rude to their brown-eyed classmates. The following Monday, Mrs. Elliot reversed the exercise and made the brown-eyed students the superior ones. And while they did taunt and tease their inferior classmates, it wasn't as intense as the first trial. So on that Wednesday, she had the blue-eyed students remove their collars, talk about how it felt, and write down what they had learned. These assignments were published in the local newspaper, and what she did spread quickly through the national news cycle. Even though her findings, I believe, were truly important and impactful, parents and teachers alike did not agree with what she had done. And because of the racial tensions prevalent at the time, only one teacher in her almost all-white neighborhood continued to speak to her after this experiment. Other researchers felt it was unethical to do something like this without parental consent and on such young children. Although I couldn't find any information to support that this was in any way detrimental to her students. Mrs. Elliott went on to become a full-time diversity teacher, an anti-racism activist, and is known as the pioneer of diversity training. There are so many other studies I could have included, but I hope that the ones I selected gave you an idea of what has gone on in the field of psychology before we had rules, regulations, and strict laws being enforced. While we sometimes learn a lot from these experiments, I really feel that the gains often come at too high a price. The legal and ethical boundaries we have are vitally important to research, and experiments that follow these rules and regulations are the only ones that should be allowed to be conducted. Don't you think? What study was the most shocking to you? Were you already aware of some of these studies? Do you think that they were unethical? Let me know in those comments down below, and I hope you found this interesting and educational. And I'll see you next time. Bye. This is a special week. Does anybody know what it is? National Brotherhood. National Brotherhood Week. What's Brotherhood?